specifically with ALS patients, um, there's so much happening with them. And I think it just plays such a big role on how they feel throughout this disease progression. Hey everybody, and thanks for tuning in to Connecting ALS. My name is Mike Stevenson, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jeremy Holden. And Jeremy, the focus of this week's episode is nutrition because March is National Nutrition Month, and we line up another great guest to chat with us on that. But before we listen back to that interview, we want to acknowledge the big news uh, that broke last week around Major League Baseball's ongoing and expanding support of the ALS community. Yeah, June 2nd this year will be the inaugural Lou Gehrig Day. Major League Baseball really kind of deepening their commitment to raising awareness about ALS. Obviously, the legacy of Lou Gehrig uh, so important to the ALS community and also to Major League Baseball. So tons of excitement about this. And, you know, I know, you know, Mike, you and I are baseball fans. Spring training is underway. Opening day is coming up. So really looking forward to a deeper dive into uh, Lou Gehrig Day, what it means, what it's going to look like, and, and how people can get involved in the celebration around uh, around Lou Gehrig's Day and, and be part of that awareness raising campaign. It's awesome. Like you said, June 2nd each year will be Lou Gehrig Day, and you're going to see different teams doing different things to honor the community and raise awareness and funding in the fight against ALS big deal and we're so grateful that Major League Baseball has taken a step and it's going to bring so many more eyes and people willing to make a difference like you said into the fold we're less than a month away from uh, baseball being played and now we can look forward to June as well as that'll be a big celebration yeah it will be and I, and I think you know I, I talked about the legacy of, of, of Lou Gehrig in both communities and I really uh, tip the hat to all the connections that ALS Association chapters have made with Major League Baseball and really mm -hmm. a, a step in that ongoing relationship between the Association of Major League Baseball and, and again Major League Baseball's overall commitment to the ALS community. Just very exciting news. Very cool to see. We'll have more on Lou Gehrig Day as we get closer to June 2nd. But for right now, uh, Jeremy, as I mentioned at the top, March is National Nutrition Month. And we found the perfect guest to come back on and talk to us about nutrition as uh, it pertains to those living with ALS. Megan Frisk is a care services coordinator with the Rocky Mountain chapter of the ALS Association. And she is someone who spent time as a registered dietitian in not one, but two different ALS clinics. Yeah, always looking forward to opportunities to talk to folks from the clinic world. So many of the people, Mike, that I know I've talked to and you've talked about some of your conversations, um, you know, clinic day is something that so many people with ALS look forward to. And we know that multidisciplinary care is so important to enhancing the value of life, extending life. And nutrition is such a key component of that. It was, it was fascinating to hear from Megan how the dietitian and the, the nutrition support is integrated into the clinical team. A lot of pieces there, and we covered a number of those uh, subtopics with Megan. So let's listen back now to our conversation. On the phone with us today from Colorado is Megan Frisk, a care services coordinator for the Rocky Mountain chapter of the ALS Association. Formerly, Megan was a clinical dietitian at the University of Colorado Hospital. Thanks for being with us on Connecting ALS, Megan. Of course. Thanks for having me. Well, March is the right month to be speaking to a nutrition expert like yourself, Megan, as it is National Nutrition Month. And Jeremy and I have a bunch of questions for you about ALS and nutrition specifically. But if you wouldn't mind, before we do that, could you give our listeners a little background about yourself, how you chose your field, and how you ended up uh, with the ALS Association? Sure. So prior to working for the Rocky Mountain Chapter, I was a registered dietitian for about seven years with two different ALS clinics, and I just really developed a passion for working with ALS patients, and it was a pretty easy transition from there to start working with them full-time as a care service coordinator. So as Mike mentioned, it is Nutrition Month, a time to spotlight on that. And given your background uh, and, and the work that you've done, talk to us a little bit about the role that nutrition plays and, and why it's an important aspect of patient care. Sure. Yeah. Specifically with ALS patients, um, there's so much happening with them. And I think it just plays such a big role on how they feel throughout this disease progression. So it might impact their energy. It might impact, 
you know, if they're having more muscle loss or weight loss with the disease. So it really can make a, a really big impact. And if anything, it just impacts quality of life, which is always important for ALS patients. Right. And I heard you mention their weight loss and I often um, speak to neurologists and cl clinicians and they're talking about weight loss following a diagnosis. Can you explain why uh, calories and weight maintenance are so critical for individuals living with ALS? Sure. Um, so they, there is a few research studies that have found that if you do have significant weight loss, it can impact how fast your progression is going to happen or um, just how you're going to feel with all of it. And they found that about 50% of patients are hypermetabolic, which just means you're burning calories faster than you were before, and your metabolic rate is way turned up. So that's why we often see that big um, jump in weight loss right after getting diagnosed. And then often once they learn that and they work with a registered dietitian, they might be able to adjust their calories and hopefully kind of plateau with that weight loss. So thinking that through and the hypermetabolism and, and trying to manage that weight loss, is the advice that you give often to do whatever you can to add as many calories to your diet? What, what is the kind of baseline advice there? Sure. So unfortunately, there's not a really specific diet that is proven with research and ALS besides just kind of a balanced diet. So definitely trying to eat as, you know, eat as many calories as you can to maintain that weight loss. But if you can, still doing it with nutrient dense foods. And then same with protein, protein loss and muscle wasting with ALS is part of the disease process. But if you can hopefully meet your protein requirements, you're going to either have less protein and muscle loss. So that's really important just to make sure you're meeting your protein needs and you're meeting your calorie needs with that. Uh, it's already becoming clear in, in talking to you for five minutes, Megan, uh, how critical a role that nutritionists play in these ALS clinics and why they're part of the process. I know that one of the many difficult conversations that take place in those settings are related to feeding tubes, and it's a very complex issue. To start with, Megan, can you explain for the benefit of our listeners who may not know exactly what a feeding tube is, what it is, and how it works? So a feeding tube for ALS patients, or it can be called a gastric tube, it is um, something that patients can use to supplement nutrition, or eventually it can be used for their primary source of nutrition. And it is a tube that's going to go um, right into the stomach. And it is a overnight procedure or even a day-in procedure for ALS patients. And it's definitely a personal choice. I always try to um, stress that when I'm speaking to my patients. You know, it's not a necessary choice for patients. So basically, it's, a, it's another source of nutrition. So often patients will use it to supplement if they are losing weight. Often patients will get it if they are either have full bar ALS or are having swall issues swallowing. And so there's several factors that go into why a patient might get a feeding tube. And um, with that being said, your registered dietitian at clinic will work with you or your outpatient registered dietitian and hopefully walk you through the steps and, and kind of the care planning for once you go home with a feeding tube. So, like I said, all decisions with ALS are very personal, and it just comes down to if it matches up with how you see your life and quality of life. But I have heard from several patients that it positively impacts their life, and they just weren't enjoying eating or it was becoming a chore. So, yeah, with that, you know, I try to keep it completely open, but I also do typically share that, that often it can improve quality of life. And it doesn't mean because you get a feeding tube that you have to stop eating. It can always be used as supplemental. It can always be used just to maintain that weight if you're having drastic weight loss. So there's several different situations you might get one. 
and there's kind of several scenarios of how you'd use one, but always a personal choice. So, As you're having those conversations in the clinical setting, Megan, do you find that there's a critical window where someone living with ALS has to make the decision on whether to, to have the procedure and, and go with the feeding tube? Yes. So specifically with ALS, we really do look at FBC, which is their forced vital capacity. So that test should get done every three to six months with the pulmonologist. And kind of the, the sweet spot with that is we, it gets a little um, more dangerous if you get below 40% with your FBC. And that just has to do with being able to tolerate the procedure and being able to either lay flat or the pulmonologist feel like your lungs are strong enough to um, withstand the procedure. So definitely you don't want to get to that 40% and then say, oh my gosh, we're interested in a feeding tube. We really try to be as proactive as we can. So we start having these conversations early. We definitely let the patients know, you know, at 50%, you should be kind of at the place where you have decided or kind of see if it's going to work into your lifestyle. So definitely proactive with that. And 40 to 50% is kind of that percentage, which the lowest we want to get for FBC. So that's kind of one of the big markers. And then besides that, with anything significant weight loss, if you're losing too much, like I said, it's going to speed up the disease process, it's going to make you feeling worse. So if you're seeing a big percentage of weight loss, that's another kind of good spot to start looking at and saying, is it a decision I'd like to go with? Thanks, Megan, for that in-depth explanation of kind of the feeding tube process and how it works. And I know it's a it's a big question for a lot of families facing ALS and one that uh, we get at the chapter level a lot. So uh, thank you for that that level of detail. Thinking a little more broadly about ALS clinics and how nutritionists fit in and, and how nutrition is part of that conversation. We know there's a ton of collaboration in those multidisciplinary clinics. How much do nutritionists and their colleagues connect during and after those uh, patient visits to discuss the impact of nutrition on someone's disease progression? Yeah, good question. So I would say a ton. There's several um, healthcare professionals that we really connect with, and I'll highlight those. So a speech therapist, we work with very, very closely, mm -hmm. and that just has to do with a lot of the patients are going to have the bulbar ALS, so the weakening of the muscles in the mouth, the throat, and so a lot of collaboration with that with a diet change, so if they need to be on a soft diet, a pureed diet, and just making sure they maintain weight with still safety of swallowing. So lots of collaboration with the speech therapist. And then even though lots of people might not think about it, even with the occupational therapist and the physical therapist, mobility is so affected. And in the arms, in the hands, dexterity of the hands, which obviously affects feeding yourself and eating. So often we're collaborating with the occupational ther therapist about tools to help bring, you know, your hand up to your mouth or just adaptive tools to help make eating easier. So those are kind of big pieces, but then also we're collaborating with the neurologist, the pulmonologist, like I said earlier for that FBC, definitely checking in so we don't get too behind on that percentage. And then just, you know, collaborating with the neurologist and making sure they kind of know where he is with nutrition. So then it can just be an ongoing conversation. Megan, I'm curious now that you are with the Rocky Mountain chapter and part of the ALS Association, do you have an even better sense of the sort of collaboration that happens between chapters and these ALS clinics? So many chapters have advocates and care service coordinators embedded in clinics around the country that are working with those clinicians to make sure that those attending clinics are receiving the resources that they need. Now that you've been on both sides, do you have an even greater appreciation for how that all works? Definitely. Yeah, I, as a dietitian for the clinics, I knew how involved they were, but I don't think I knew the extent. The plus of what I do is really getting to know the family members and the patient on a 
even more personal level. You know, they're able to bring me into their homes. I mean, not right now, but in a virtual sense. And I, you know, get to know their family members. So even though the clinic gets to know them very well too, I'm able to give them kind of those more inside look to what their day-to-day life is and maybe something that they might be missing because they really are seeing them for those four hours. And as most people know who go to an ALS clinic, it's, it's a very condensed, it's very valuable, but it is a quick four hours and so much is thrown at you. So I think it's great that I get the extra time with them to just slow down and really just see what their day-to-day life is and how I can help them with that. And then the collaboration is so, so important just to be able to go back to the team and kind of relay that personal information that then helps them care for their patients even greater. Thank you again so much, Megan, for your time today and this look uh, at how nutrition can impact the lives of those living with ALS and, and how both the clinical side and now that you're at the chapter of the ALS Association, how that all comes together. We really appreciate your time. Of course. Happy to be here. And thank you for having me. Couldn't be more grateful for Megan finding time to sit down and talk to us this week. Again, it is National Nutrition Month, so we'll share some resources on the show notes on how you can learn more about nutritional support for people living with ALS. Thanks again to Megan. That's going to wrap up this week's show. Remember, you can subscribe to Connecting ALS either at connectingals.org or wherever you are listening to this particular episode. You can also leave us reviews on those services. We appreciate that because it helps others find the show. And if you're interested, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter to make certain that you see all of the latest content. This episode was produced by Garrett Tiedem of the ALS Association's Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota chapter. Thank you all for listening. We'll connect with you again soon.